my life is following you wherever you go. The highest joy for Emily and I is to walk with you. Our greatest desire, God, is yours as well. That we would be with you where you are and we would behold your glory. No matter how far, God, we have to travel. I found something here. I found something among these people. And I believe that one of the greatest revivals of your presence is going to land in this nation. And I just want to be around when it happens. So Lord, would you come? Would you change everything? Where would we be, God, if it wasn't for your presence? You've been everything to us. Become everything to them. Become everything, God, to our children. If 
something here I've never found before and I have so many people to honor tonight but I have one hour before we get kicked out I think and have to honor the neighbors so we'll do all of that in the morning so don't be offended I really love all of you um, but I do have to honor my wife turn around that's an angel is among us that's my wife and our baby and I have one, two, three more kids right here. They're jet lagged. <laughs> but we came here in October and um, I, I met this joyful, crazy woman at the Jesus Conference named Ruthie. And they began to pray for us and we wept. And I said, there's something different about these people. And I don't know if I've ever when someone asks me to come, you can turn this off, by the way. When somebody asks me to come, I usually say, well, let me pray. I got to, you know, speak to my wife. Um, first and foremost, speak to God, but I just felt this urgency in my spirit to say yes. <clears throat> and we came not knowing what to expect. Uh, I honestly thought I was going to get a second, I mean, a second honeymoon, which we did. We went to London for three days and had the most amazing time. And I got to be with my wife alone, which is like a rarity for us with four kids. And after three days, I go to this living room and there's more people that are crazy, just like Ruthie. And they're zealous and they're passionate and they're hungry. And I go inside of this living room and they began to worship. And if we could turn, turn, yeah, I know you're trying, Heidi, you're doing, Heidi, we love you, we honor you. I wouldn't, I don't know how to work the LED screen, so it's, it's okay. Um, but I met all these couples. I met Paul and Sarah. I met Blake and Marcy, Andy and Lucy. There's, there were so many of them. And I was so impacted by their hunger. They began to worship. And I looked at Emily and I said, did you feel that? And basically cried and then you guys all prayed for us and it just wrecked our lives and then we did the hungry for him gathering and it just began to build this thing in me of, of like I want to be here I just want to be around these people and I've never actually touched or been as close to a place that's so on the brink of revival and I'm not sure that they realize it and you got to understand like we, I come we have I think there's almost 25 of us from the United States that came and I'm going to honor all of you guys by name tomorrow. Just kidding. Don't hold my word with that. Um, but we came because we believe in this. Not in our conference. We believe in you. We believe that the Lord is doing something in this nation that I haven't seen before. And so we're flying home and I, I couldn't get over this shaking inside of me. And it wasn't like there was a thousand people at Hungry for Him. But there was hungry ones. And I saw these kids. I saw Micah. I saw these kids, man. Look at them. And I saw the way they loved and the way that they were on the floor. And I thought, I want to get my kids around these kids. And I've never seen hunger. I saw Joe. How old are you? 12 now or 11? 13. Wow. Were you 12 then? I don't know. We'll figure out the math later. But a young guy. And I'm watching him weep on the floor. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know if I've ever seen a 12-year-old like this. And when you tell them, guys, you're on the brink of something, they're like, we are? Like the humility, the heart. And so my wife and I are flying home and, and I get this vision, and I don't know if this makes sense to you, it does in America, but I get this, this picture of a group of Navy SEALs and a group of Green Berets. And in, in our military, in the United States military, these two units in the military have two distinct assignments. The Navy SEALs are like kill and destroy. They come into a city, 
take out a target and they leave. But Green Berets, they actually go into cities and they bring help and resources and infrastructure. And the goal is not to be in and out. The goal is actually to help equip those inside of that city, the military inside of that city, so that the military can be strengthened military can be encouraged that they can build their own infrastructure so that they can see a move of God now I'm talking spiritually I know the Green Berets don't do that but we're doing that so that they can see their nation and the influence begin to take place in their own way in their own unique way and and I'm on the plane and the Lord starts to minister to me about a habitation here in the United Kingdom which we've done these now in the United States this is our first one we've ever done overseas and And he said, I want you to go, but I don't want you to just go and do an event. I want you to go do the event, and I want you to stay with your family for an extended period of time in that nation until I tell you to leave. And and he's he's given us a date as of now, but he said, until I tell you to leave, and I just want you to, to lock arms with these people, and I want you to not just do the habitation, but continue to do gatherings after the event. Whenever God opens up venues in whatever city God opens up, and he's already opening up different cities, And I just want you to go stir it up and then give it to them. Give it to them to steward. Give it to them to run with. And I just believe the Lord's doing something unique where I've never quite seen unity and fellowship and community like this. You know, in the West, one of the things we struggle with is we have churches on every single corner. But we have no idea what their vision is. We have no idea what they're running after. We have no idea what their pursuit is. And the Bible I read says, the left hand can't tell the right hand, I have no need of you. And how could we cry out and expect God to return, that Jesus Christ come in the fullness of his kingdom, Ephesians 1 says, that all that is in heaven and all that is in earth is gonna become one. But this will not happen until there is a perfect and spotless bride. So I began to study and I started realizing every, almost every major revival and move of God in the United States started in England. And I started researching the, the, grand, the Great Awakening in America started with an evangelical revival that happened in England. The Azusa Street Revival with an amazing man named William Seymour started with a revival in Wales under a man named, by the name of Evan Roberts. I started realizing, Lord, there's history between our nations and I've been crying out for America for a very long time and I found people that I've, unlike any group of people I've ever met before and I feel like Lord there's a bridge and you want to start something here and you want to send us back on fire and I and I just come to tell you tonight humbly I believe that we are here to receive just as much as I believe that you are going to receive from us but there is like a a gasoline and a fire that's about to meet And I'm believing that the Holy Spirit if we would believe it is going to break out in England and what could take place if we just start having multiple gatherings a week, not just to gather, but to cry out for something. You know, I I know that this is a bold statement. I don't know if we're even allowed to do this legally, but we'll figure it out, but I might as well just say it. I I was walking inside of the, the, the tube, you guys, we call it a subway, but the tube in London, and I'm thinking to myself, what if we just gathered hundreds of people inside of the tube and just began to sing worship unto the Lord? and see people begin to get saved? What if we actually went out into the streets and left the four walls of a building? What if we began to actually stir something up? And so I believe that God has called us here simply to have a catalytic moment together. It wasn't until in Acts 2 they're worshiping together in one accord that God begins to move. But I'm telling you, we can't go if religion keeps holding us back. We can't go if the Sunday morning Christianity that we've known becomes normal. And honestly, guys, like, I could share my testimony with you, but I really think it's pointless. Just know I love you and and I'm giving myself a disclaimer. I come humbly before you. And like I said, my heart has never been moved by a group of people like this. But I have come to declare war on principalities. I have come to declare war on religion. I have come to declare war on everything that has held this nation back under this gray fog. It's what I keep seeing, this this gray fog. And I sense the sun is about to shine again. And it's shining upon a people who are not ashamed of the gospel, who are not ashamed of who they are in Christ, who are not ashamed that they're the righteousness of God in Christ 
who actually believe the arise and shine, Isaiah 60, for the glory of the Lord is going to rise upon you. Deep darkness will cover the earth, but it's not going to cover you. And it's time that we stop being silent and hiding inside of our safe churches. And God is raising up boldness and zeal with a people that know why they have boldness and zeal. Because they met this man with holes in his hands and his feet, a scar on his side, and his whole life screamed this one thing, that every ounce of blood I dripped on the ground, I dripped for you. And what's devastating to me in the church is that we can hear the gospel and we can look at the cross and tears don't fill our eyes anymore, but it's become a story. And I've come to declare war for the sake of the gospel. And I, I haven't brought my whole family here, spent the money that we have, like dealing with jet lag with an infant. Try that. Honestly, she's been amazing. I think it's been more me, honestly, that's been the baby. But I haven't come here to just do a conference. We didn't come here to just have another good session. If the presence and the power of God doesn't show up, we're wasting our time. Can you guys open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4? Sorry, Noah, you're stuck. All right. Can we honor Noah and this worship team? So good. So proud of our guys. Pastor Kaylee is with us and Cynthia was up here and Noah's here. We all were on a plane together, literally in rows, right next to each other. And I just believe that the Lord is, is doing something and he's gonna do something in us like we've never experienced. I don't have time to, to get too deep into what I wanted to get into, but the good thing is, is we've got two more sessions. Tomorrow morning starts at 10, is that right? And one thing I wanna do is I wanna start on time, all right? I noticed something here. You guys show up late to things. I love you, but we're gonna, we committed to God that we're gonna start at a certain time. And so we're gonna start at that time, all right? With you or without you, because worship is not for you, it's for Him, all right? So be here at 10. And then, at, and then I think we might just, I have a feeling it's just gonna like bleed into the afternoon, which is gonna be amazing time of worship and prayer honestly a session where we don't know what's going to happen and then tomorrow night we're asking the power of God to come in a mighty way which is at 6 30 tomorrow okay so I, I don't want to rush I don't want to um, I do want to honor the time I want to honor the neighborhood but there's one thing I felt from the Lord to, to really get across tonight are you guys in Revelation chapter 4 yeah you guys going to talk back tonight you awake you alive you excited okay but before I get to Revelation 4, I want to give you context for chapters 1 through 3. It's amazing because I didn't tell Ruthie what was in my heart. And I love it. Ruthie's so bold, she plays the waves. And she just comes up here and reads everything I'm going to preach. But it's so God. And it's showing me that like we really are of one spirit. And I want to give context before we get to Revelation 4 and 5 because I think the greatest thing God's doing in this hour, in this nation is he's bringing a reformation, not with something new, but with something ancient. It's not some new idea, new scheme and structure of how to build church. He's bringing us back to ancient paths, the scriptures talk about. And this ancient path has a lamb that is bleeding, yet standing right in the middle of it. And in Revelation 4 and 5, we get this picture, but you've really got to see Revelation 1 through 3 to understand what the Lord is trying to get John to see and get. So verse 1, you don't turn there, stay in Revelation 4, but verse 1 of chapter 1, it tells us what the book of Revelation is about. And it doesn't say that the book of Revelation is about dragons, it doesn't say that it's about bowls, it doesn't say that it's about fire and meteors that are going to hit the earth, all right? Although all of those things are in there, what it tells us the book is about and truly revealing is that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want you to listen closely. If you take notes, take them, all right? This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we're, when we open the book of Revelation, we are looking into Jesus Christ. We're not looking into something that's just a story. He's literally giving us insight into the revealing of who he is. This is all happening inside of him. So it says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave him to show to him and his bondservants. 
Some of your translations might say servants. The original uses this term, and I want you to write it down, bond servants. And this word bond servants is important. It's important that we don't just read it as servants. It's important that we read it as bond servants. When you go back to the book of Leviticus and Exodus and and you study even ancient tradition within the children of Israel, there was this type of, of servant that was more than a servant, but they were a bond servant. And how you became a bond servant is you actually owed a debt to somebody, according to scripture. And if you couldn't pay off the debt, Right, if you owed someone 100,000 pounds and you couldn't pay the 100,000 pounds, there's, a, there's a, a route you could take. And that route is you for seven years have to serve the person that you owe the debt to. And after seven years of serving inside of that master's house in which you owe the debt to, you're free to go. And the debt is considered paid, right? But if you found, it says, a better life with that master during the seven years, you can choose to remain his servant. And this would be called a bond servant. And if you chose to remain his servant after seven years, like maybe you're outside of this house and and you owe this person 100,000 pounds, but your life was on the streets and your life was full of drugs and your life was full of alcohol and your life was full of all of the things of this world, and this master brought you in, and you could never pay him back for what he gave you. So instead of throwing you in prison, he invites you into his home. I want you to hear the gospel. We're still in the first verse of Revelation 1. So rather than sending you away, he invites you into his home, and he says, serve in my house. And I promise you, in my house, you're going to find a better life than you ever found out there. And so they would find a better life. And if they found a better life and they fell in love with the master in which they owed the debt to, they would walk out into the city and they would find the doorpost in the city. And they would put their ear against the door and an earring would be put into their ear, marking them forever as belonging to that master. That was an actual biblical concept that the Lord tells us all the way back in the law. It was something that was honored in Israel and you were forever identified as a bondservant to that man. And if you notice in the book of Revelation, you hear language like the revelation of Jesus Christ to him and his bondservants. And you constantly hear this thing over and over again, to him who has an ear, let him hear. In other words, to him who has found the door. Anyone ever read that Jesus is the door? Anyone that has ever found the door and has chosen to put their head against the door saying, mark me, I want to belong to you forever. In other words, you cannot see this book. I I don't hear preachers preaching about the book of Revelation because I don't think we understand it. But he says, if you want to understand this, You can't understand this because it's a revelation of Jesus Christ to him and his bondservants only. It doesn't say any other group of people. If you want to understand this book, you have to be a bondservant. And so you start going through this this book and John is caught up in the spirit on the Lord's day. And he's writing this letters commanded by Jesus himself to send to seven churches. And in that time in history, it wasn't this church and that church and this church and that church. Churches were identified by cities. Churches were identified by the church of Ephesus, Smyrna. I mean, you're talking about, they didn't do anything separate. The whole city was the church. This is what I believe is coming. And there's seven churches and five of the seven churches are given a rebuke and two are given encouragement. In every single church, listen, to the loveless church, we don't have time to go through it all, there's this common denominator among all seven. Although five are rebuked and two are encouraged, although they're uniquely talked to, there's one thing that every single church, every single one of them cannot bypass and they all have to overcome something. So to the loveless church, it's told at the end, to him who overcomes. The persecuted church is told at the end to him who overcomes. The compromising church is told at the end to him 
who overcomes. The corrupt church is told at the end. To him who overcomes. The dead church is told at the end. To him who overcomes. The faithful church is told at the end. To him who overcomes. And the lukewarm church is told at the end. To him who overcomes. All churches are, re- are uniquely rebuked or encouraged, whether good or bad. There's only one, listen, thing that none of the churches can avoid. One thing that none of them can avoid, and it's they have to overcome to see the kingdom. And when I started praying about, Lord, where do you want me to start? How do I start? The expectation that I sense in my spirit, the expectation on this group of people, on the, on the people coming from the United States, how do we even begin? And the Lord led me to Revelation 4 and 5 because I think that there is a picture of the Lamb that we have to see and the provoking of a response. How many of you want to see revival and reformation in our day? Raise your hand. If you don't want to see it, don't raise your hand. But if you really want to see it, lift your hand high. Okay, so there's, listen, we have to start here. Because if we can just get this one thing, in, I mean, branded upon our hearts, he'll show us everything else. All right, so you get to Revelation 4. You guys there? Yes? Okay. Verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like the trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here. I want you to underline in your Bibles, come up here. So John is down somewhere, and he's looking at a door, and he hears a trumpet speaking to him, coming out of that door saying, come up here. He says, I will show you things which must take place after this. So I want you to recognize it's not till John comes up is he allowed to see things. He says, come up here. And I will show you things. We got to come up. And it says immediately, immediately after what? After he came up. I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven. This is what God wants him to see. And there sat there one like Jasper and Sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 elders. And they had 24 thrones, and the thrones, there was 24 elders sitting on them clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunders, voices. Seven lamps were on fire, burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass that was like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were 24 living creatures full of eyes. I'm sorry, were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion, and it begins to describe them. And it describes what they're saying, and it says that these four creatures are crying, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. In other words, they've got eyes everywhere. They're seeing every side of him. And the only thing they can come up with of the God who was, is, and is to come. In other words, he doesn't change. He was, from the time he said, let there be light until this moment, he's the same exact God and they've been staring at him for eternity and the only word that they can come up with still is holy. They can only sing one chorus in heaven. Like we get concerned and weary and drowned out when we gotta sing a song over and over and over again in church while in heaven, there is a chorus on repeat forever. And when is that gonna end? Never. Like there's something we've gotta come up into And they come up and he sees this chorus being sung by 24 elders and these four creatures. And it says, whenever the living creatures, in verse 9, give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before him singing, you are worthy, O Lord. To receive glory, honor, and power. For you have created all things. And by your will they exist. And then you get to chapter 5. We're just going to keep going just for a minute. Go to verse 2. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And there was no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth that was able to open the scroll or look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed 
to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And I looked, and here's what I want you to hear. And behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though he had been slain, and he's having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And they begin to worship him. And they begin to fall down before the lamb. And they all have harps and they all have golden bowls full of incense. And this incense, it says, is the prayers of the saints. And they sang this new song. And the new song is, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals. For you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. And out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made us a kingdom. I want you to listen to the song. You, the song is singing about you. I want you to recognize this. There's a song. It's the Lamb's song. And the Lamb's song is singing, I redeemed you to God. The Lamb's song is singing that you're going to be a kingdom on the earth of priests unto God. And it goes on. And it says, and we will reign with him on the earth. The church for decades has been trying to get out of the earth while Jesus is trying to get in the earth and inviting a generation to reign with him on the earth. Listen, the direction of religion is up. It's like the Tower of Babel. Let us reach heaven. The direction of religion is I got to get out of here and I got to get there. The direction of the kingdom is I'm groaning to get in here. Ephesians 1, there's a fullness of time coming just like the fullness of time that came when Jesus, who is 100% God, is put inside of a seed inside of a woman. And it says, in the fullness of time, Mary was overshadowed by the Spirit of God. There's another fullness of time coming. How many of you believe that Jesus' birth, listen, was real, like legit real? It wasn't some, raise your hand high if you believe in the birth, the actual physical birth of Jesus Christ. Okay. Raise your hand if you believe in the actual death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The literal death, burial, and resurrection. How many of you literally believe he ascended? Raise your hand. Then you have to literally believe he's coming back. Where are you trying to go? If he's trying to get here, why are you trying to get out? So there's this song that's being sung in this moment. It's not just a figment of our imagination, but in this moment, right now, there is a song taking place on a throne, around a throne, on a sea that is mingled with fire and glass, emerald rainbow above his head, lightning and thunder is proceeding out, and the song they're singing has to do with you. So I've been asking the Lord, why a lamb? Why did you introduce the world John the Baptist, he's baptizing. Jesus, his cousin, walks up. John makes this statement. He says, behold, the Lamb of God, he who comes to take away the sins of the world. It's how he's introduced to the world. So I asked the Lord, why are you introduced this way? And, and on top of that, it's how he wants to be seen forever for all of eternity. Why a lamb? I mean, a lamb is like a baby, sheep. It's not even full grown. It's, if you look up a lamb, it, it actually describes it as immature. Why a lamb? I read this one statement one time that says his innocence is everlasting. But you have to understand, it's not just a lamb, it's a lamb that's bleeding. And the lamb in heaven makes sure that you still see the wounds. And so John doesn't see the gospel until he comes up. And, I, and guys, I know that this is bold, but I think many of us have answered altar calls without ever seeing the gospel. I think we answered altar calls. Listen, I, we have, some of you are not gonna like this, but I don't care, because I'm gonna go back to the United States at some point. Matt and Ruthie will work it out with you. But I'm gonna tell you exactly what God tells me to tell you. And, and listen, I, I, for a long time, I struggled with false humility. I wanna tell you what true humility is. Humility, according to scripture, is agreement with God. It's you come low under God and you say, not my will, but your will be done. False humility goes, nope, I'm not agreeing with that. So here's what false humility is. 
I tell you you're the righteousness of God in Christ, false humility goes, oh no, wretched sinner I am. True humility, I tell you you're the righteousness of God in Christ because you didn't get to decide that. He decided it before you were ever born. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. What? Like before you ever sinned, there was already atonement for you. This is unbelievable. You weren't part of the meeting when he said, I'm gonna make them clean as me. You had no say in any of it. So true humility goes, I tell you you're the righteousness of God. Humility goes, I agree. That's humility. Humility is, is you are under the lordship of Jesus and everything that Jesus says. And so Jesus himself tells us of this song as he's showing John after he comes up and he goes through the door. And when he goes through the door, he sees a lamb, a lamb that is slain and he's standing. And I believe the reason that it's a lamb and there's a song being sung about us that we have been redeemed to God and we're going to reign with God on the earth is because forever the Father wants to show you when you look at him, I want you to remember your heart, my heart for you. Every time you look at him and you see the wounds, I want you to remember that I love you as much as I love him. I believe the greatest revelation that God is going to reveal to young people in this hour that are stuck in identity crisis. I don't know what it's like here, but in America, I can't even say it, tell you if you're a boy or a girl anymore without somebody getting mad. It's demonic. It's not political. And we think in our nation that a president's going to fix it. No, only Jesus can fix the identity crisis of a nation. So boys, it's okay to be girls. And girls, it's okay to be boys. That is the message that's being told to our children. And we're just hiding in church, giving our cute messages, seven-point series. And the creation is groaning in Revelation 8 for the sons of God to take their place. This is about the sons of God taking their place and reminding a generation exactly who you are in Christ. And every time you see the Lamb. And I believe the greatest revelation that our kids are going to get is I love you as much as I love Jesus. I think the greatest revelation that my kids, I want them to get it. I want them to understand it. My dad, listen, I grew up, I honor my parents so much. My dad would tell me growing up, you are the, right, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're as righteous as God. And I believed it. And then I went to a school that was a certain denomination and they told me I was a sinner. And I came home and I told my dad, I said, they told me I'm a sinner. He said, don't listen to that. And he leads me to Romans six that I have been set free from sin. And then I went to school and they brought me to Romans seven. They said, no, you haven't. And then I went home, my dad led me to Romans eight, told him, keep reading. Right, but we choose where we wanna land because it fits our lives. And I'm telling you, it's time to go up. Because you're the righteousness of God in Christ. And the more you believe you're a son, the more you're gonna live like one. Because the scripture says, as a man thinks in his heart, so will he be. So if you think you're disgusting, how do you think you're gonna live? But if you think you're righteous, because that's what the Bible says, then you might live like that. God doesn't just change your position until you die. He changes your condition. And if it was just about changing your position to get to heaven, then he would have never said, we're going to reign on earth with him. But we're trying to get out. He's trying to get in. And there's this song being sung as the lamb is in the center of everything. And then the revelation takes it even further and it says, and we will be the wife of that lamb. <laughs> what? You ever thought for five minutes on the fact that you're going to marry God and the implications of that? Anyone married in this room? Raise your hand. All right. Any husbands, your wife is just like a tenant in your home? Raise your hand if your wife is a tenant in your home. Nope. My son raised his hand. <laughs> you can't raise your hand for that, bud. But how many husbands would say your wife leads your home with you? Raise your hand. Where do you think we get that from? He says, you're gonna reign with me. The implication that we're gonna marry God isn't we're just gonna slip into heaven. The implication that we're marrying God is God goes, let's build together. Let's raise together. So he's desperate 
for John to see this revelation and he sees a bleeding lamb. The revelation the Father wants us to see is that lamb was wounded for you. And every time you see him, I want you to run into his wounds. And in chapter five, he's still up there. And listen, it says, harps and bowls of incense. This is what's happening in heaven. And there's a new song in their mouth. And the song is declaring, he is worthy, we are redeemed, and we are now a kingdom of priests unto God, and we will reign on the earth. You got that? Now go to Revelation 14. <clears throat> so now we got this group of 144,000. and There's all kinds of doctrine around this, like as if this is the only amount of people in heaven. But simply 144,000 is 12 times 12. It represents discipleship. And I want you to see why in a second. Because how many of you know, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Does it say 144,000 or all? It says all. You guys alive? You okay? Anyone offended yet? No. Okay, praise God. Let's keep going. But you get to Revelation 14 and John is still in this experience because he went up. And he responded to the voice saying, come up. And he sees the lamb in the center of everything. This is the greatest reformation I think is taking place is God's declaring war on everything that is man-centered and man-built. Man-centered ministry, man-centered anointing, and God is taking the reins back and he's gonna be put on display again. And everything's gonna gather around him again. So you get to Revelation 14 and it says, then I looked and behold, a lamb, there's the lamb again, was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps and they were singing a new song before the lamb. Remember, they were also singing a new song in Revelation five. And there's these four living creatures. We just read about it in Revelation five and the elders and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Okay, stop. Remember, we just read in Revelation 5 that there's a new song and the lyrics of the new song is we have been redeemed to God. Does it say that or not? Are you guys with me? So it's saying that you have, he's describing once again, the same exact encounter, yet he's identifying it's for a select group of people. There's a reservation only for this 144,000 but it's the same encounter. The four creatures are there, all the elders are there, the harps are there, the bowls are there, and there's a new song. And listen, it says, only those who have been redeemed from the earth will know the song. Hear what I'm saying? But we were just told in Revelation 5 that we were redeemed from the earth. How many of you believe you've been redeemed to God? Raise your hand. You've been redeemed to God. So if you've been redeemed to God, you know the song. It's reserved for those who have an ear to hear. And it goes on and it says, these are the runs that were redeemed from the earth. They, these are the ones who were, not, who were not defiled with women, so they're pure, they were virgins. These are the ones, and I want you to underline this, who will follow the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men being first fruits to God and in them was found no deceit for they were without fault before the throne of God. So we got the lamb at the center, worshipers all around him again. We got this 144,000 and the mark, listen, of the 144,000 is they're pure and what separates them from everybody else is they will follow God at any cost. They don't, you don't hear them saying things like, I'll follow you as long as there's enough money. I'll follow you as long as my family feels settled. I'll follow you as long as my future is clear. I'll follow you as long as, Lord, you, you meet the standards of living that I desire for my kids. It doesn't say they followed him when they fleeced him and got responses. It actually, there's nothing about these 144,000 that says they'll follow him as long as. We need to get free from as long as Christianity. They just follow him. And remember, it all started with come up here, I have something to show you. So again, I want you to see this picture. The song is not hidden from us in Revelation 14. 
It was shown to us in Revelation 5. And if you have an ear to hear and you recognize that God has redeemed you, you'll know the song. And the song is singing over you that we're going to reign with God on the earth. And the only way you know the song is you have a characteristic about you. And here's the characteristic. We'll lay it all down for God. Guys, there's no better place to start than looking at a lamb. Coming up, looking at a lamb and saying, we'll leave everything behind to follow you. Because listen, we can't cry out for an ax level move of God if we're not willing to live like they lived in the book of Acts. For too long, we're crying out on Sunday morning and then our lives look no different Monday through Saturday. And God's coming to a group of people saying, if you're gonna cry out for this, I dare you to live like this. It's what Matt talked about. Are you actually willing to lay it all down? Let me tell you, this is what New Testament Christianity looked like. Peter's there receiving offering. We're all so scared of the offering. Let me tell you how they did offering in the New Testament. Because it's worship. In the New Testament, there's this couple. And they sell land. And they come to Peter. And, it, and listen, in the book of Acts, there's revival taking place. Everybody's getting healed. People are fighting to get in Peter's shadow. I mean, God is among them. They're in unity. There's not one person among them that had need. But you know what another characteristic of the revival was? Was that people were selling what they had and they were bringing it to the apostles' feet. And a woman comes, and, or a man comes, and, and he lies about how much he sold and he only gives a little bit. He gives God a leftover. And he drops dead. I know we don't like this, but if you don't like this, then you got to learn how to fall in love with the Bible because it's in there. I don't ever get amens for this part. She drops dead for lying to the Holy Spirit. So then here comes the wife. And Peter's leadership has me asking all kinds of questions. Because I'm like, if I'm Peter, she's walking up and I'm going, listen, your husband lied and he's dead. Please tell the truth. Peter doesn't even warn her. He says, how much did you sell? She does the same thing. She lies. And Peter's response is, you will see the, men, the men's feet that carried your husband away. See, you feel the fear of the Lord, right? But we don't want to know that measure of God. Just keep me comfortable on Sunday. Don't mess with my money. Don't mess with my life. I just want to be comfortable. And we have religion today called comfort. And the God is called self. And we have more messages about self-preservation and self-help and life coaching than we have truly about self-denial. I mean, you ever read the Bible when it says, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself, pick up your cross. And if you don't, you're not worthy of me. I don't hear I, I just don't hear preaching like this. And honestly, I'm not claiming to be something. I just am, got this Holy Ghost frustration when I read my Bible and go, oh my God, my life doesn't line up with this. Oh, the, the preachers that I'm listening to in America, Lord, this, it doesn't line up with this. Is somebody gonna say something about it? Is somebody gonna talk about it? Because Lord, we're crying out for revival and maybe we're not getting it because we're not willing to live like we're in revival. So there's this mark of this people. And they get to hear the new song and they get to see the beauty of the lamb. But the mark has to be they will follow him wherever he goes. So I wanna talk about, because listen, John, not until he comes to this high place does he begin to see. And can I have the worship team come back? Listen, Philippians 3, 8 through 14, Paul describes the high place like this. Yet indeed, I count all things lost for the excellence, for the gaining of the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, I love it because Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on and he says, and the fellowship of his sufferings. That word sufferings in Greek, listen to this. That word sufferings in Greek is not just beatings, although that was a part of it for Paul. 
but it's emotionally what gives you pain and grieves you, God, I want to be acquainted with that. I mean, Paul's literally saying, I wanna be acquainted with your pain. I wanna be acquainted, I wanna have intimacy, God, with what breaks your heart over a generation. I wanna have intimacy and, and nearness, God, to the brokenness you have over the lost, to the brokenness you have over the sick, to the brokenness that you have over the bound, to the brokenness that you have over the people stuck in religion on Sunday morning, going through an hour and a half of religious motion. I wanna feel your breaking, God, for them. And Paul is saying, I want this so bad, I will lose everything at the cost of gaining this. What? Suffering. What are we talking about here? And he goes on and he says, that I be conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or I am already perfected, but I'm pressing on. Listen to the heart of this man. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Stop. He has a revelation that God's love laid hold of him. Listen to what, what is behind. Listen, because we can, I can get you all to run to the front tonight. We can lift our shoes and say, send us God. But until you see the why behind Paul's crazy zeal, it'll never last you any time whatsoever. Paul is standing there as Christians are being killed and God goes, I want that one. I mean, God rescues him through forgiveness. We always talk about the Luke 7 woman, right? That comes in, she busts the oil on the feet of the lamb and, and everyone in the room is offended with her because religion hates radical. They don't like loud noise and zeal and passion. Religion wants you to calm down. They'll tell you that you're immature. But here comes this woman and she busts in, she breaks this box and she's pouring oil on his feet. And that his own disciples are saying, man, we could have given this to the poor. And he says, look at me, Simon. I mean, imagine the God of the universe saying, look at me when I talk to you. And he says, when I came into your house, you didn't have oil for me, but she did. You didn't have water for me, but she did. You didn't kiss me, she hasn't stopped kissing me, Luke 7 says. And it goes on. And he says, I got a parable for you. There was a person that owed debt to two men. And, and or there was two people and they owed debt to two men. One man owed a much greater debt than the other man. And they both were forgiven of their debt. Who do you think would love him more? And they said, well, the one that was forgiven much would love much. And he says, right. And what is it trying to show us? Why did the woman bust into the room and throw oil on his feet? because she caught a glimpse of that lamb that's bleeding. She caught a glimpse of a love that is so undeniable, a love that would find you at your worst moment. How many of you were drug addicts or alcoholics or just stuck on some sort of form of addiction? Raise your hand, raise your hand high, be bold. This is an amazing testimony. God came into your life through his power and he rescued you out of it. And you're not even, I mean, it does, you can't even remember that old person anymore. He drug you by his love and in his kindness, you were drawn to repentance. And there was a love so great that Paul found that was greater than anything he could find on the earth. Greater than what any child of his own could give him or any spouse could ever give him. Paul found something in love, a God who is nothing other than love. I mean, the only attribute he, he equates with himself as being, he says, I am love. Doesn't say I am wrath. First John 4, 8, for God is love. And God is not bipolar. He doesn't have mood swings like us. The four creatures full of eyes have never caught him on a bad day. They've never found a bad side of him. He's nothing other than undeniable, unspeakable love. And he rescued you and he said, you're mine. Scriptures tell us that no one comes to the Father unless he's drawn. That the Father was inside of Jesus, reconciling the world to himself. A bride that committed adultery on him. Listen, it says in Hosea, it says, 
I want you, son, to go marry a daughter. I want you to go marry a bride, and she's going to commit adultery on you. And here's how we're going to win her. We're going to take her into the wilderness, and we're going to allure her with kindness. Think about the love of God. So you have Paul, and Paul has this revelation of, how could you love me this way? After all I've done, after all I've put the church through, I mean, Jesus didn't say you're persecuting Christians. He said, you're persecuting me, Saul. After everything, Jesus, that I put you through, after all the people he potentially killed, or at least watched die, Paul's saying, you want me? I need you to understand, 12 disciples, 12 apostles, they're told, stay in Jerusalem. I got another guy for the Gentiles. The Gentiles is the rest of the whole world. He picked the guy that's killing Christians to be the guy for the whole world. What's your excuse? Paul is captivated by the love of God. And he's so captivated that he writes, I'm pressing toward this thing. And what I'm pressing toward is I've got to lay hold of this man of love the same way he laid hold of me. And I will lose everything. I will count it all rubbish to just see more of who that man is. Paul gives us the roadmap because he says, I forgot, listen, if there's one thing I've apprehended, it's I forget those things which are behind me. Listen, what did Paul have in his past? And he's saying, I have permission now to leave it all in the past. I've obtained that. But I'm forgetting all the things that are behind me and I'm reaching ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. What is the upward call of God? I'm almost done. Paul tells us the upward call of God in that verse, be willing to lose everything if you must. Conformity to death, being willing to take on his pain and desire to gain Christ alone. Paul tells us this is the roadmap that'll lead to his power and his resurrection. You want resurrection, you gotta be asking for suffering too. How many of our prayers include that? God, give me your burden. And most of all, he wants to be apprehended in a deeper measure by that love. And it'll result, listen, in a heart that says, giving up everything is as if it's rubbish anyways in comparison to what I gain. Matthew 7 tells us, just write it down, don't turn there. Matthew 7 tells us, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And then there's a sad couple of words that says, and few find it. Right before that, it tells us broad is the way that leads to destruction. In other words, if if it's easy, we should be asking ourselves what road we're on. But it says narrow is the gate, listen, is the way. You know what the word gate means? It means pressure. It says narrow, listen, is the gate. In other words, the way through is going to take pressure. It's not going to come easy. And few find or even are willing to walk on this road. And I personally think that there is a difference between believing in Jesus and following Jesus. And how I know, listen, Matthew, book of Matthew, there's this young rich ruler that comes to him. And he says to the Lord, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds to him, he says, follow the commands. And he goes, I do that. And he goes, all right, you really wanna know what it takes to inherit eternal life? He says, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And the young rich ruler can't do it. The young rich ruler believed in him, but he was unwilling to pay the price of following him. Salvation is free. It's the most free gift you've ever received in your life. I mean, the epitome of grace, I I love this explanation of grace more than any, the the clock turned off by the way, which is dangerous, so. Um, The epitome, listen, of grace is this. Someone kills your son. I've shared this with some of you, but just hang in there. Someone kills your son, your firstborn son. How many of you have a son? Raise your hand, make it personal. Someone comes and he kills that boy. As a parent, you have really three responses you can respond with. You can react in revenge, and you can kill them back, and that would be revenge. You could take it to the courts, go through the justice system, 
put him in prison for life. That would be justice. Or you could forgive him and that would be grace. Listen, the father didn't just forgive us when we killed his son. He took it further than that. He didn't just forgive us and say, okay, you're good, you can go. He stood in the courtroom of heaven with us on the other side and he said, listen, not only am I, not gonna, am I gonna forgive you, everything that belonged to the son you killed, it now belongs to you. The inheritance that the son you killed had, I'm gonna give it to you. The garment that my son was wearing, I'm gonna put it on you. Oh, and by the way, you can live in my house too. Talk about grace. Guys, when you begin to catch just a glimpse of who God actually is, remember the lamb is bleeding for a reason. And Revelation wants you to remember the lamb is still bleeding. The wounds are still there because every time you look at him, it causes you to look back and say, you were my atonement. You were my righteousness. Your innocence has become my innocence. We put you on a tree. It's easy to believe him. Salvation, most free gift you've ever received. It's a whole nother thing to say, I have to throw everything out of my life to go, I will follow you. And he goes, that, that road, that's not an easy one. Because the same way they persecuted me, they're gonna persecute you. The same way they hung me on the tree, they'll do it to you. He comes to his disciples and he says, do you actually want to sit at my right and my left? Are you willing to drink this cup? I don't know how many, and guys, I'm talking to myself too, how many of us actually, truly wanna follow the lamb wherever he goes? And I've come with this like mission in my heart to England that I wanna find those who wanna follow him. And I wanna link arms with them so that when it gets hard and we forget our song, we sing it back to each other. And the song is worthy is the lamb. You know, I read about the Moravian movement, a hundred years of revival breaks out over prayer and worship, a hundred years. And little kids and toddlers like this would stand on the shores as their parents are drifting away into the distance, going to tell the world about Jesus and kids knowing they're never gonna see their parents again are shouting, may the lamb receive the reward of his suffering. Where is that today? We're so about our comfort. We're so about our systems. We're so about our churches and our things we're building. And I sense this, if we want the move of God, we gotta throw it all off the table and say, come. And when you come, we're not gonna leave you alone. You're not gonna be able to get rid of us. We'll follow you wherever you go. I want you to stand to your feet. This is a love sick call. I don't have time to read it. Are we like in trouble if we don't, are we okay? We have to honor this moment. I would ask you not to be moving around, please. God wants to do something tonight and he can do it in five minutes if he wants, okay? But in the Song of Solomon, listen, there's this woman and she's a Shulamite. And she's in love with her beloved. And I want you to see again what love will drive you to do. And in chapter five of Song of Solomon, she loses him and she's searching for him in the streets. She can't find him. She's going to every street corner, yelling in the streets, have you seen my beloved? See, this is what love, radical zeal and love looks like in the church, is people desperate for their beloved with a cry and a groan in their heart of come, Lord Jesus, come. And those in the city, the daughters of Jerusalem are what they're called. They're telling her to be quiet because she's disrupting them. And they begin to beat her and they begin to abuse her and they begin to tell her, you gotta be quiet now. And after they're done beating her in chapter five and after they're done abusing her, she musters up a few words and she doesn't say, how dare you? She doesn't go and hold a sign. She doesn't go and try to get justice for herself. She can only muster up a few words and here's what she chooses to say. If you find him, tell him I'm sick with love. She tells the people that are beating her, if you find him, tell him I'm sick with love. And those that had abused her begin to ask her, what makes him different 
than anyone else. See, this is what a generation is coming to you wondering, what makes your God different than any other God? What makes Christianity different than being a Muslim? What makes it different than just any other religion? And this woman begins to describe her beloved. She begins to tell her beloved of, tell them of her beloved's love for her. See, there's no other God that was ripped in half and marred beyond any understanding. There's no other God that left a throne in heaven to come as a seed inside of a woman. There's no other God that ever said, out of the anguish of my soul, I saw you. And out of the joy, listen, that was set before me, I kept going. What was the joy that was set before him? It was you. What other God could say such a thing? And so the woman begins to describe him and you get to chapter six and they respond back to her and they say, tell us where he's gone that we may seek him too. You wanna talk about evangelism? It's time we put on zeal and we're willing to whip, rip through every wall, go through every corner to get close to him. We will follow him at all costs and our following will become the witness to a generation. What would cause you to leave everything? What would cause you to throw everything away? What would cause you to leave that opportunity that was set before you? What would cause you to do that? Come here, let me show you. Look at his eyes. His eyes are on fire. And inside of that fire, it's called jealousy for you. What other God could say that? This life, Revelation describes, are those that, the mark, listen, of the 144,000. Tonight is just an invitation. An invitation to not just salvation, but to following. Not just to we've been rescued, but now we're going to attach to. Not just, I, I'm, I'm going to go to heaven one day. No, no, no. I'm going to give my life to see heaven on earth. This kind of life, and I promise you I'm almost done. This kind of life is what Revelation describes as the bowls of incense that are before his throne. This is a sacrificial life. This is a life of worship. This is a life where your literal life becomes a fragrant to God. And it's not till incense goes up does the Spirit of God come down. And if you study incense in Exodus 30, it has to be crushed down to a powder in order to smell right. If you study the anointing in Exodus 30, it has to be compounded together. It's got to be pressed down. Wine requires crushing. Oil requires pressing. And there's an invitation tonight to let's enter into the sufferings of the Lamb for the nation of England. Let's enter into the brokenness of the Lamb on behalf of a nation. And let's say, say, God, give us your heart for every single person on the street, walking, thinking they can see, but really they're blind. Give us your heart, God, for every church that's going through the motions. Give us your heart for every pastor, God, every leader. God calls it incense. Acts 4, 23 through 31. Here's these men that have really given their life. They didn't just pray a prayer to get to heaven. They have given their life to Jesus. And they had just been beaten and abused. And it says, and being let go, they went to their companions and they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God in one accord. And they said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot in vain and the kings of the earth took their stand against the rulers who were gathered against the Lord and against his Christ for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before it was done. Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant your servants, it doesn't say safety. It doesn't say grant your servants protection. He says, grant your servants boldness that we may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal 
that you would stretch out your hand with signs and wonders, that it may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place they were assembled was shaken. You want the room to shake? We've got to have the right prayers. And they were all filled with the Spirit of God. And they spoke the word in boldness. I want you to listen to this. This is so powerful. A life of incense is a life that will follow Jesus wherever he goes. This becomes a fragrant offering to the Lord. And it sits before the throne. And he smells it. And he responds with fire. In Acts 4, we see the whole thing put together. These men are beaten, tortured, and hurt. And they don't pray for protection. They say, God, give us more boldness to keep speaking. And their incense goes up. And anyone ever been, and we've, we experienced it tonight in worship. Anyone ever experienced in worship when people just start yelling and you don't know why? Like this, this I know this group knows what I'm talking about. Like the Holy Ghost, just the air seems to change in that moment. The Holy Spirit takes over and a groan begins to come out of you. You know what I'm talking about. This is happening with these men while they're sharing of being abused on behalf of the Lord. They're just sharing testimonies of, look, I was whipped. And their response wasn't, oh my gosh, we need to pray for you, brother. They start shouting and the room begins to shake. We have become weak as a people, myself included. And I want to invite us all tonight that if we're going to do this, we're not here to just have a conference. If, I mean, if we're going to go after this, like if we're really going to say, Lord, we want to do these hungry gatherings and bring the hungry, may you find a people that will truly follow the lamb wherever the lamb goes. I want you to lift your hands. And I don't want you to lift your hands if you really don't mean it. But if you mean it, I want you to lift your hands high. Maybe you've given your life to Jesus, but it was as far as a prayer. It was as far as answering an altar. But tonight is an invitation to, I dare you to follow the one who loved you with an everlasting love. There's no one else more worthy on the planet. The revelation is we gotta go up because there's a door standing open in heaven. And I say over you, United Kingdom, there's a door standing open in heaven. It's time to go up. Come on, close your eyes. It's time to go up. I want you to see the lamb who's bleeding. And I want you to tell him, I'll follow you anywhere you go. Tell him, I'll follow you anywhere you go. Find God your 144,000. We're not trying to get out, God. We're trying to get you in. He was clothed in glory. Exalted high. In the train of his robe. It filled this town. And the angels circle around him, and they cry. Come on, they cry, every voice. And they cry, you sing it, sing it. Sing it again. Hold, hold. 
And